The Patriots won but three games in 1975, and it seemed a bicentennial ago since they were a bona fide contender. Beneath these harsh facts, there was hard evidence to suggest some reasons for their renaissance. For three years, this team was being rebuilt through the draft. Thus, they were not long in the tooth, but long on young talent. And buttressed by Chuck Fairbanks, the Patriots trim the fat off bodies and minds for a meat grinder of an early schedule. Baltimore, Miami, Pittsburgh, and Oakland were the first four opponents. So their season would be made or lost in the first four weeks. Steve Grogan, who picked apart the Dolphins and gave the no-name defense a very bad name indeed. Whether passing or running, the young quarterback from Kansas State was unstoppable as he led New England on a 30-14 to 14 rampage that had Miami coach Don Shula muttering, this is about as bad a beating as we've had in a long time. Conversely, it was the best Patriot performance in years, and as people in Boston asking, who's Jim Plunkett? While the Patriots were making fish chowder out of the Dolphins, New England lost 27 to 13 to the Colts in the opener, and the future looked bleak indeed, until they crushed the Dolphins, 30 to 14 in the second week. Critics tossed aside the victory by calling it luck. A commodity, they said, was sure to desert them against the world champion Pittsburgh Steelers. Indeed, the Patriots trailed Pittsburgh 20 to nine until quarterback Steve Grogan shattered the steel curtain with two long range touchdowns. Scores by Russ Francis and Darrell Stingley triggered New England's second straight upset victory, 30 to 27. Pittsburgh's Terry Bradshaw, number 12, a two-time Super Bowl winning quarterback, is a master of the backward forward pass. This Bradshaw bobble was one of eight Steeler fumbles. The turnovers kept the Patriots in the game early and later almost knocked Pittsburgh out when the new gun in New England, Steve Grogan, number 14, began to take advantage of the Steeler generosity. Grogan completed 13 passes for 257 yards and two touchdowns against a Steeler defense that is, surprisingly, the worst against the pass in the AFC. But Terry Bradshaw wasn't finished. Behind 30 to 20, Bradshaw nearly squirmed Pittsburgh off the hook. Though he finally went down, Bradshaw later rose to hit tight end Randy Grossman, cutting the deficit to 30 to 27, with nearly three minutes to go in the game. On their last drive of the game, Bradshaw passes to Frank Lewis and Lynn Swan, number 88, brought the Steelers close enough for a field goal try, but it would fail. Pittsburgh is now one and two and glum. The Patriots two and one and smiling. Two weeks ago, the Dolphins fell 30 to 14. Last week, the Steelers 30 to 27. Are the Raiders to be surprising New England's next victim this week? Roy Girello opened the game by kicking off into the end zone. Rookie Ricky Feature headed for the right sideline, turned the corner and went all the way to the Patriot 45. But New England couldn't take advantage of their good field position, but got the first break of the game when confusion by the Steelers' two deep men caused a turnover.
Cleveland had the ball on the Pittsburgh 26 because number 35, Jack Delaplane, was suddenly called off the ball by number 33, Frenchie Fuqua, who dropped it. It was the first gift of the game, but by no means the last that would be handed to the Patriots. The Pittsburgh defense, as they would throughout the first half, refused to give ground, and the Patriots could merely translate their big break into three points on John Smith's 42-yard field goal. The score now stood 7-3. Pittsburgh, on their next series, gave the ball right back when Franco Harris, this time, was a victim of the bouncing football. Without question, the steady downpour was making it extremely difficult to handle the football. But this was little consolation to Harris as he picked himself off the soaked tartan turf. New England had the ball on the Pittsburgh 44 and quickly took further advantage when Grogan completed only his second pass of the day. This one to tight end Russ Francis. But again the steel curtain descended and the Patriots again settled for a field goal from John Smith, this time from the 30-yard line. With three seconds left in the quarter, Pittsburgh's lead was now cut to a single point. On their second play of the next offensive series, Bradshaw fumbled the snap, and the Patriots had another excellent opportunity on the Steeler 23. No matter, two plays later, Grogan's pass for Russ Francis was high and deflected to Glenn Edwards for an interception. Another good opportunity down the drain, but the comedy of errors was hardly over. Slipped out of his hand on an attempted pass. This time, New England recovered on the Pittsburgh 7, where it seemed they could hardly fail to capitalize on the Steelers' generosity. But fail they did, when Steve Grogan threw into a crowd in the end zone and Mel Blunt came up with the ball. The surreal comedy that was happening couldn't go on, or could it? For after getting the ball, Rocky Blyer going around his right end lost the ball and New England recovered their fifth fumble. New England themselves had coughed the ball up a total of three times and appeared to do so again on the very next play when Sam Cunningham lost it. But the fumble was out of bounds, and the Patriots were able to get on the board again when Grogan hit on two straight passes to Francis and Cunningham that brought the ball down close to the Pittsburgh goal line. Here, sure-footed John Smith kicked his third field goal of the half, and the Patriots cut the lead to one point again. Anything but intimidated. Steve Grogan to Russ Francis for 38 yards and a touchdown. And suddenly the vaunted Steeler defense seemed slightly less awesome. A repeat shows that Grogan sent Stingley in motion, then play fake to his right, drawing Steelers with him and allowing Francis to drift into wide open spaces. Francis registered six receptions on the day, but this one came at a time when the Steeler defense was threatening to put the game away. The Steelers never quite did recover. The Patriots once again converted a critical ball possession play, and once again the man involved was tight end Russ Francis.
Many say the second-year receiver already deserves all-pro recognition, but even all-pros occasionally reveal their mortal nature. Francis dropped his sure first down pass, but through Francis' misadventure, Rogan discovered he could work effectively against Pittsburgh's left side, and on third down, he did. In retrospect, A.J. Johnson's third down catch takes on great significance, for on the very next play, Grogan once again caught the steel curtain off balance. Rarely does a team beat the Steelers' secondary with a long pass, and yet within a three-minute span, second-year quarterback Steve Grogan had done so twice. A replay shows just how simple it was. Grogan set up behind solid pass protection, then lofted a perfect rainbow over Steeler cornerman Mel Blunt, number 47. Stingley's speed did the rest. 58 yards later, the Patriots had a 23-20 lead. And having overcome an 11-point Steeler advantage, suddenly the Patriots' upset over Miami looked much more believable. It's been said, as Franco Harris goes, so go the Steelers. Unfortunately for Pittsburgh, Franco wasn't going. But on the Patriots' side, Steve Grogan and Russ Francis continued their relentless assault. Francis' 48-yard catch and run carried to the Pittsburgh 21. Forever keeping the Steelers off balance, Grogan realigned no less than four potential pass receivers prior to this snap as New England closed in for the kill. Darrell Stingley's clutch reception carried to the Steelers' six. A replay shows Grogan's keen concentration in waiting for Stingley to break into the clear, then putting the ball on the money. Patriot offense now controlled the tempo of the game. And as period three passed into period four, Rogan converted New England's enviable field position into the game's biggest touchdown. The yards get tougher inside the 10, but as the replay suggests, a rollout quarterback has all the advantages. Rogan's touchdown lifted New England into a 10-point lead, and the Steelers were stunned. Their proud defense had surrendered 21 points in just over 10 minutes. And with their offense stymied, Pittsburgh's situation appeared rather bleak. Play, his persistence put the Steelers back in the game. Tight end Randy Grossman's seventh catch brought the Steelers to within three. And with a two-minute warning approaching, the burden now fell upon the steel curtain. Possible fourth and 25, Bradshaw threw his finest pass of the afternoon. But the catch by Frank Lewis was to be Pittsburgh's last miracle. With three ticks left in the game, the outcome hinged on Roy Girella's 48-yard field goal attempt. Pittsburgh's stirring comeback sailed three feet wide of fulfillment. For the defending Super Bowl champions, it was a lesson in humility. But for the young and eager New England Patriots, it was a satisfying and important win. Many football watchers wrote off New England's victory over Miami as a fluke, but it wasn't. The Patriots are a good young football team with an abundance of ripening talent. Today, they dealt the defending Super Bowl champions a decisive defeat. And indeed, Chuck Fairbanks' squad appears on the verge of contention in the rugged AFC East. Chuck Fairbanks, the head coach of the NFL's other Cinderella team, the New England Patriots, has already confronted the toughest part of his schedule. 
Last Sunday, quarterback Steve Grogan led the Patriots to their third consecutive upset victory. This one, a 48-17 shellacking of the previously unbeaten Oakland Raiders. Grogan did everything for New England except solve the school crisis. He ran for two touchdowns and passed for three more. But Grogan isn't alone in creating the surprises that have vaulted the Patriots into a first place tie in the AFC East. There's tight end Russ Francis, number 81, whose emergence as a primary passing target has diversified New England's offense. Sam Cunningham, number 39, has been injured the last two years. But this season, he signed a three-year, $600,000 contract. And the Patriots are making him earn it, using him frequently as a pass receiver as well as a ball carrier. In case Cunningham gets hurt again, the Patriots can call on Jess Phillips, number 35, a proven plunger with nine years of experience. In the New England secondary, where two rookies are starters, the steady play of veteran Prentice McRae, number 34, has helped camouflage a potential weakness. If the Patriots do have any weak spots, they weren't apparent against the Raiders. And with the roughest part of their schedule behind them, the Patriots might be strong enough to earn a spot in the playoffs. The fellow in the blue jacket banging his hands together is Jack, and the guys in the red shirts are his giant killers. In reality, Jack is Chuck Fairbanks, head coach of the red shirts, the New England Patriots, who in reality are giant killers. The schedule makers penciled New England in against four pro football titans to start 1976. Four teams that won an astounding 43 of 56 regular season games in 1975. The New England schedule began with the Baltimore Colts, who were 10-4 in 1975 and champions of the AFC East. Though they lost 27 to 13, the Patriots discovered that they had a gritty, determined quarterback in second year pro Steve Grogan, number 14 from Kansas State. When week two rolled around and in came the Dolphins, also winners of 10 games last year, Steve Grogan gave the no-name defense a bad name. Grogan passed for three touchdowns and rumbled in once himself as the Giant Killers had their first victim by a 30 to 14 score. The Super Bowl champion Steelers were certain to squash the upstart Patriots the next week. But with Grogan passing for 257 yards, again two touchdowns, and again running one in, the Patriots slew themselves another giant. The Patriots got an almost immediate break when Raider running back Clarence Davis fumbled on Oakland's second play from scrimmage. Steve King recovered on the Raider 43 and Sam Cunningham, number 39, began his best day as a pro with a 24-yard run up the middle. For Cunningham, it was the beginning of a 125-yard total offense first half as determined running by Sam the Bam, Grogan, and number 32, A.J. Johnson, kept the Raiders back on their heels all day. Johnson's determination paid off in a touchdown on this play. When seen from up top, we can see that A.J. ran right over Skip Thomas and Jack Tatum for the touchdown that put the Pats on top seven to nothing. 
kept a drive alive when he recovered Davis' second fumble of the game on the New England 12. But two plays later, even Casper couldn't save the Raiders when Mark Van Egan fumbled and Steve Zabel recovered to keep Oakland off the board. The Raiders had lost a big scoring chance, but the Patriots were 92 yards away, not the best field position. Steve Grogan would quickly improve it. Watch number 73, John Hanna, on this play. It's the classic screen. Hanna makes an aggressive pass block on Monty Johnson, then heads to the right, arriving before the ball ever gets to Sam Cunningham to escort him on a 19-yard gain. On the 92-yard drive, Cunningham would account for 44 yards in running and receiving. But Grogan did not stay exclusively with him. He spread the wealth around using tight end Russ Francis, who many feel is the best tight end in the NFL, though just four games into his second season. This catch was good for only one yard, but Francis goes after everything all out. This desire and a repeat of the play that shows what a good effort it was are the reasons for his stature in pro football despite his tender years. Two hundred forty pound Francis and two hundred twenty five pound Cunningham get it done with power. While for speed, Grogan turns to number eighty four, Daryl Stingley. Stingley's fumble could not be recovered by the Raiders before it rolled out of bounds, an unfortunate break for Oakland. For one play later, Grogan sent Stingley in motion left. Got about 20 minutes to wait for him to get into the end zone, then nailed him with a 21-yard strike. New England now led 14 to nothing, and suddenly those wins over Miami and Pittsburgh weren't such upsets after all. If you look to the left, you'll see a wide open Dave Casper, but Stavler never got a chance to release the ball to him. The Patriots had survived another Oakland scoring scare and went back to work. Watch Raider defensive tackle Dave Rowe, number 74, as he follows a pulling guard inside and Cunningham goes right through the area he left. Ted Hendricks, number 83, also overruns the play to the left. And Sam the Bam is off on an 18-yard run. Johnson then picked up 10 yards, Brogan 13, Cunningham 14 on a screen, and the Patriots were on the Raiders 16 with less than a minute left in the half. But the Patriots perhaps scored too soon. Brogan's pass to Marlon Briscoe gave the Patriots a 21-7 lead, but 40 seconds still remained. The harried Madden, more, much more was to come as the second half began. The Brogan-Cunningham passing partnership teamed for 41 yards to the Raider 19. Then, despite exhortations from Madden, the sophomore quarterback from Kansas State threw to a wide-open Daryl Stingley for a touchdown. After the kick, New England had increased its lead to a hefty 28-10. It should be noted that Randy Vitaha, number 18, has finally joined Stingley and Russ Francis in the lineup. The Rabbit, New England's chief deep threat and number one game-breaker, has been out since preseason with a fractured cheekbone. And until today, strangely enough, he has been used only as the fifth man in Fairbanks' nickel defense. Tony McGee sacks Stabler for a 10-yard loss.
Only Stabler's fumble, which was recovered by Sugar Bear Hamilton, saved the snake from the ignominy of a fourth and 36th situation. On their first offensive play, New England exploited the right side of the Raiders' defense when Andy Johnson followed number 73, John Hanna, for 22 yards. With the pride and poise boys tottering, Chuck Fairbanks kept them further off balance with a second reverse of the game. In the first half, Darrell Stingley ran it for 21 yards. This time, he got 27. Three plays later, Drogan finished it off by rolling right on the option and taking it in himself. New England had gone 64 yards on only eight plays and now had taken a commanding lead, 35 to 10. Dignity for Stabler occurred when Mike Ciani deflected a high pass to Prentice McRae, who took it a long way back. On a sensational return, the three-year veteran from Arizona State had taken his interception 88 yards. However, clipping brought it back to the Patriot 38. But sensational Steve Grogan took over and challenged the Raider defense head-on. With a quarterback draw that had completely fooled the Raiders, Grogan had gone 30 yards and got an additional 15 tacked on when Jack Tatum was penalized for a late hit. This was to be a very familiar sight this sunny afternoon in Foxborough, Massachusetts. There's no doubt the Raiders play the game with relish and with players like Neil Colsey, Willie Brown, George Atkinson, Jack Tatum, Skip Thomas, and Charlie Phillips in the defensive backfield, they have talent aplenty. But today, the penalties were badly hurting them. Two plays into the fourth quarter, Grogan again on the option, opted for his own number and behind fine blocking, scored carrying the ball. New England 42, Oakland 10, and who would have believed it? Again, New England's stubborn defense stopped Oakland. And when the Patriots took over on offense, Grogan let a former Raider, Jess Phillips, have his moment of revenge. Phillips, number 35, took a screen for 18 yards, plus an added 30 yards because of unnecessary roughness on the part of the Raiders' secondary. George Atkinson was the culprit this time except that Atkinson outdid his teammates by being hit with two penalties on the same play. With the ball moved all the way to the 10, Phillips ended what he began. With his unique fucking Bronx style, Phillips tore through the right side, bounced off Jack Tatum, and went in standing up. to score against the team that lets you go. Though the kick was blocked, New England's lead soared to a whopping 48 to 10. The Raiders behind reserve quarterback Mike Ray would score one more touchdown, but it meant little on a day that clearly befuddled everyone in the Silver and Black's tidy organization. And after an opening day loss to Baltimore, who would have, could have guessed that New England would be 3-1 and one at this point in the season? 
for they have in three consecutive games upset the Miami Dolphins, Pittsburgh Steelers, and Oakland Raiders. And the way this fine young football team has looked, maybe, just maybe, those wins weren't upsets at all. The New England Patriots look like they're for real. will be tested at the moment. Doe inside handoff on a third and six, and Giamona in trouble. And he loses all the way back to the original line of scrimmage. Fourth down, and the Jets will have to turn it over. And a bad kick. Off the foot of Carroll. And Mike Haynes just watches it roll. Down to the 42-yard line where New England takes over a good field position. They move from their own 41-yard line. And immediately, Grogan wants to go to the air. And the screen pass goes out to the left. And it's Cunningham down the left side. And Cunningham gets the first down in the Jet territory at the 40-yard line. Motion man, Andy Johnson. Grogan fires to Johnson. A lot of room in front of Sucks. He gets the first down and Suggs laid way off of Andy Johnson. First and 10, the handoff inside. Big man, Cunningham, inside the 20 to the 19-yard line. Gain of six. It'll be second down and four. Four. Singly in motion, inside handoff. Johnson, big hole to the 10-yard line. Stopped there by number 59, Bob Martin. With an offensive line that's moving the Jets' defensive front, completely out of there as you look at it again. Gaping hole for Andy Johnson, and there may not be a better offensive pair at the moment in the league. Steve Burks, one of the messengers, bringing in the plays. This is Cunningham, and Cunningham booms around the corner and taken out of bounds inside the five-yard line. He'll mark it at the three. Inside the five, second down. And Johnson pulls in, touchdown, New England. And the New England Patriots wasted little time using one pass. They marched all the way down the field for the initial score with 58 yards in three minutes and 16 seconds. We'll be right back. Up there showing a different front. Namath dumps it off, anticipating the blitz. It goes to Marinaro, and he's dumped back at the 30. Moving all the way back to the 25, it was Tony McGee who hustled in there, and they, he had a lot of help from his friends. He's by Detroit. First and 10, New England, their own 20. Quick toss, goes out to Andy Johnson, right side, and look at him turn it on. Up close to a first down, he may have it. Second and short, goes to Johnson, big hole, as New England just riddles the Jet defensive line. And he's out to the 41-yard line, first and 10, New England. Well, both backs in the pattern. Broken with the time, and oh, he throws the ball. Complete out there to number 88. That's Marlon Briscoe, and he has the first down. First and 10, 45-yard line of the Jets. Singley is the motion man, number 84, the big man. Cunningham with the call, and he calls inside the 40. They'll move it back to the 40, a gain of five, second and five. Bad snap or a bad handle, we're not exactly sure, and... Taken there by Dwayne Carroll, who does the punting. And Steve Nelson was immediately on top of Dwayne Carroll. Had two consecutive difficult breaks. That was clearly a bad snap, as you can see. Dwayne Carroll rescuing the football. But this in the wake of the loss of Marinaro, and we'll try to get a report as quickly as possible on Ed's condition, materially reduces the Jets' offensive structure. Third down, two. Cunningham. Huge hole, and Cunningham has the first down out to the 49-yard line. John yeah, Mitter out the Lombardi Award a few years ago. I'll tell you in a moment. This is Johnson, right side. Turns the corner, and he gets four yards. It'll be second down and six. He just wrote a note. He said, Frank, I met you in Houston. And waiting the Jeep down. On second down and six. Inside handoff, Cunningham. The big man rolls up close to another first down, down to the 42-yard line, where it'll be third down and one. Seven on third and short yardage. Grogan. He'll have the first down easily. And more. Greg Bunnell stops Grogan at the 30-yard line, a gain of 12. And this is what this young man has been doing all year long. 
You saw Alex. Let's look at it again. And he goes to the outside where the pressure isn't on. He can take a look around, see if there's anyone open. And then, of course, this is what he does well. And I think the teams that really can co uh, keep a rally going is the team that can have a quarterback that can run once in a while. You see Staubach once in a while. At the 30-yard line of New York. Rogan. Barring out to number 82, Steve Burke. And he's very close to another first down. Two-year man out of Kansas State, Steve Grogan. This is Johnson. And Johnson will have another New England first down. Domination by New England thus far in the game. Johnson right side again, and he goes down under big number 76, Warren Pillars. And he's down to the inside the seven. Out of Kansas State. Played with Grogan there. Calhoun, he bobbles and it comes back. A great the... play, a great play. <laughs> How about that? They practiced that all week, right? Former teammates of Kansas State. Nothing with 7.46 remaining in the first half. And let's look at this a moment ago. Calhoun hit there and hit hard as he hit the line of scrimmage. Fumbles the ball. It was immediately picked up by Grogan. <laughs> Move to the outside, six-yard touchdown as Greg Buttle really popped Calhoun at the line of scrimmage. Ball came loose, and Grogan came up with it. Those are linebackers sticking their noses in there. They'll drop out of there. Namath reading a blitz, throws it away, and is picked off by Hayes. Open 10, their own 43-yard line. Sam Cunningham bowling up close to midfield. Out USC and beating Ohio State. And Grogan takes it for the first down on his own. Little subdued now. Second down and ten. Inside handoff. Cunningham likes the way this man runs. He oh, gets yeah. every inch out of him. Oh, yeah. A little bit last week. This on third down. Grogan, it looked like a set draw. He has the first down and down he goes at the 33. Bob Martin made the stop, but that looked like it was a set play. Second down and 10. Play action fake. There's Grogan. He can either roll or run from that play. Wisely steps out of bounds. He has the first down at the 21-yard line. I know that it's going to come to an end. I, I know that I'm not going to be able to play much longer physically. Uh, when that time comes, I'll be able to cope with it. I know that. But I don't know if it's going to be this year or next year or the year after. Uh, I don't know exactly First down. why, but I'm here. Wide open. Andy Johnson. Andy Johnson out of the backfield. Touchdown. His second of the night. Something, even if it's wrong. They got to make it. They have to commit themselves. They have to go in, knock someone down. And no one's knocking anyone down on the field right now. They're up against an immensely superior team. That a personnel beautifully coached, a team that is on the verge of becoming a powerhouse in this 48 to 17 over Oakland. Going, he brings in the play of second down and 20. Or rather, first down and 20. And the end around, Russ Francis. Yeah, he does. And Francis corralled out there at the 24 yard line. Brogan. And Brogan takes a shot on a blitz. And still gets it off to Randy Vataha, close to the first down, and Grogan changing that play at the line of scrimmage. New England with the ball, the motion man is Johnson. The big man gets the call, tries to break to the outside, does. And look at Cunningham, as he goes up to the 44, a gain of seven, it'll be second and three. Johnson, the motion man. Grogan, Johnson wide open again as he was in the first half. Up in front of the cornerback, Schaefer sucks. He really puts his head down, barrels in with his shoulder. He's a beautiful running back, Andy Johnson. Sometimes you wonder about the mentality. Indeed you do. Second down and 10. Grogan looks one way, rolls the other, has Hannah in front of him. Hannah with a good block. Look at Grogan. All the way. Boy, and when we go back and look at it, watch the block of number 73, John Hannah. They can throw the ball. They run a ball cub with authority, and they can do this. They're mobile, they can run. Now, this was a set play. Grogan with the quick flip to the right, throws the defense. Hannah got in front of it, number 73. Number 70 is Leon Gray. Grogan 
as he was at Kansas State, a fine runner, cuts back, 41 yards, touchdown. I just add can't throw that long with, with any consistency anymore. On first down, Cunningham gets a call and moves out of the 35 to the... Rogan, all the time in the world, dumps it off to Cunningham. The big man has the first down, moving out over the 45-yard line to the 47-yard line. Jets only rushing two men. And Bataha makes a very patented Randy Bataha catch right on the sidelines. Oh, almost impossible to defend against. First down. Rogan once more. There's the big man, Russ Francis, his first reception of the night. I've been waiting all night for them to put him on display. This is a truly super athlete. A marvelous javelin thrower. Let's take another look at this. On his way to possibly represent the United States in the Olympics as a javelin thrower, he injured his arm. And I'm pretty sure that he's related to Joe Francis, one of the great Oregon um, Rose Bowl game. I don't know. I don't know. He, he grew up in Hawaii. Yes, Joe did too. On first down. And Sam Cunningham storms into the end zone. Oh, wow. I said they wanted more. They got it. 34 to 7. We'll be right back. Phillips, and let's go back and look at Cunningham. Beautiful blocking, cross blocking, open the hole, and he comes. Well, Frank and Howard, when you play defense, you have to go. Quarterback remains broken. He hands off to Forte over the right side. And the rookie from Arkansas ambles for good yardage. It's um, the fact that he was black. Third and 13. Firing over the middle. Francis has the first down. And look at the big man from Hawaii, battle linebacker Larry Keller. 10. Forte in motion. Grogan to Calhoun. And Calhoun out of bounds at the 47-yard line, short of the first down, collected there by Ed Taylor. It was about $6 million. Calhoun left side, and it'll depend upon where they mark it. I believe he gets the first down as they are going to mark it right at the 40. He Grogan. Forte, and Forte out of bounds as he moves it down to the 35-yard line. We're up. Play action on third and short, and Brogan will get the first down and much more as Risley goes down to the 23-yard line after getting the first down. Safety. Come on, Jazz, bring it back. Just going for the block. Ooh, and they just about got it. And it, Jazz Jackson makes an error. <laughs> oh, boy. Jazz Jackson, down 34 to 7. Thought he'd take a shot at it. Oh, Roman, don't blame him. Romanishan made the... Thought he could pull it off. Bobbled the ball. And Calhoun corns into the end zone, and nothing is stopping the Patriots tonight. Seven seconds remaining in the third quarter, and yeah. Calhoun goes into the end zone from the 12-yard line. He's looking on the New York Jets. There's seven seconds remaining in the third quarter. They leave the Jets 41 to 7. At Orchard Park, the Bills and Patriots needed a fresh supply of sure grip as 11 fumbles turned both offenses sour. When there was continuity, quarterback Steve Grogan's rollout offense mystified the undermanned Bills. The threat of silky smooth receivers like number 81 Russ Francis make defenses respect Grogan's arm, but in effect pave the way for the planned runs that make the spindly general so doubly dangerous. In this disaster of a season for Buffalo, the headlines and statistics still belong to O.J. Simpson, whose victories over defenses are empty and pyrrhic and muddied by a river of Buffalo defeats. Simpson scored twice against the Patriots, but the Bills lost 26 to 22. Simpson scored only a single touchdown against the tough young New England Patriots. But Bob Greasy's 16-yard hookup with tight end Jim Mandich proved quite enough. 
At the bottom of the screen, number 81, Russ Francis, knew he'd committed a no-no on this play, but quarterback Steve Grogan and wide receiver Marlon Briscoe didn't. Sadly for New England, Marlon's sideline scamper went for naught. A crushing offsides call wiped out Briscoe's game-tying play. Worse yet, it derailed New England's playoff express. Mired in a deep rut of adverse publicity over his salary, the Bills' O.J. Simpson decided to dig himself out by trading punches with number 72, Mel Lunsford, the heavyweight defensive end of the New England Patriots, an indiscretion that got number 32 thrown out of the game. While some say that it's O.J.'s money belt that bogs down Buffalo, others point to a defense that they say needs an exorcist to disgorge the devil from it. However, it would have taken a higher authority to deny the heavenly receptions made by Randy Vataha, number 18, and Daryl Stingley, number 84. Only Patriot mistakes kept this game from being a rout. Twice, penalties canceled touchdowns, including this tour de force by tight end Russ Francis, number 81. New England had plenty in reserve. They got 145 yards rushing by Sam Cunningham and an 89-yard burn down the sidelines by rookie cornerback and punt returner Mike Haynes, number 40. While the Patriots won in a breeze, 20 to 10, and remained two giant steps behind the Colts in the AFC East. During the course of the season, their 3-4 defense had mellowed and matured. Now it was just the right vintage to bottle up the lightning of Lydell Mitchell, number 26. The Patriots limited Mitchell to 52 yards, held Burt Jones to a paltry 95 yards passing, and with the aid of two interceptions by rookie Mike Haynes, reduced the NFL's leading offense to rubble. After chewing up Baltimore, AFC rushing leader Lydell Mitchell was not so fortunate, as defense keyed the Patriots 21 to 14 victory over Baltimore. Mitchell gained just 52 yards, and Burt Jones could find bombs away buddy Roger Carr for just one early score. Jones kept trying, but after his early burning, rookie Mike Haynes, number 40, intercepted two passes intended for Carr, and the NFL's highest scoring offense could put just 14 points on the board. More than anything, the Patriot defense led New England to its seventh victory in 10 starts. For the Pats got only 21 points, usually not enough to beat Baltimore. The Colts averaging 31 points in their first nine games. Steve Grogan's short touchdown pass and eighth and ninth touchdowns of the year had New England ahead 21 to 14 at the half, the ultimate final score. Desperate for the tying touchdown, Jones kept trying for a quick strike. But New England shut out the Baltimore Colts for the entire second half and moved to one game behind in the AFC East Division race behind the frustrated Colts. New England Patriot tight end Russ Francis is one of several fine young offensive talents belonging to that team. Then there's fullback Sam Cunningham, as well as nifty A.J. Johnson. And there's quarterback Steve Grogan, 
a second-year pro whose strong arm and all-around leadership have put the surprising New Englanders in contention for a playoff berth. New England's youngsters appear perhaps a year or so behind the flowering Colts, but with Miami on the wane, the Colts and the Patriots figure to play one or two important games in the years ahead, and today's game is one of them. Would not be outdone. On their next possession, Steve Grogan initiated his methodical assault. Sam Cunningham carried this screen pass out near midfield, from which point Grogan sent guard John Hanna out to blaze a trail for A.J. Johnson. The little publicized Johnson has been a pleasant surprise to the Patriots. In the first half, he averaged five yards every time he touched the ball, both as a runner and as a receiver. But the man who keeps defenders off balance is Grogan. For a big man, Grogan is highly mobile, and his extemporaneous style forces defenses to commit, opening up other possibilities. Grogan's scrambling set up this dump pass to tight end Russ Francis. Three plays later, Grogan again rolled, forcing defenders to commit, allowing reserve tight end Al Chandler to get lost in a crowd. Chandler's touchdown nodded the score at seven. Defenders of patriotism, who closed out period one with musket smoking. But Burt Jones slows down active linebackers with tosses into the flat. Number 44 is reserve running back Don Calhoun. Subbing for an injured Sam Cunningham, Calhoun reeled off 84 first half yards, including the longest run of the day. Fifty-four yards later, the Patriots were in scoring position. A running back's perspective reveals the enormous hole that the Patriot front opened for Calhoun through Baltimore's well-respected defense. Dedicated line blocking provides the key to a ground game success. Leon Gray, John Hanna, and the rest of New England's much improved offensive wall have been earning large measures of respect, and rightly so. Brogan's keeper put New England back in the lead. Down the cold attack and forced to punt, an opportunity for New England's first round pick to showcase his skills. This was not rookie cornerback Mike Haynes' first punt return for a touchdown this season. In fact, this wasn't a punt return for a touchdown. For somewhere along the way, Mike Shue hit the chalk line. But the following kickoff served notice that the half was far from over. Doug Bodoin exploded through his interference to the Colt 45. From there, Grogan picked out his favorite big play receiver as New England rallied to beat the clock. Russ Francis pulled a muscle on this play, but the 33 yards he covered set up the go-ahead and eventual winning touchdown. A replay shows that Grogan sent number 82, Steve Burks, deep to clear that side of the field. Grogan then threw underneath coverage to a wide open Francis who carried inside the Colt 10. But New England's offense sputtered. 
Enter kicker John Smith for an easy field goal attempt. In his exuberance, number 47 Tim Baylor blasted the English-born kicker, granting the Patriot offense a reprieve at the Colt four-yard line. Here again, Grogan's maneuverability proved the difference as New England recaptured the lead. Grogan's three-yard sprint came with only 26 seconds remaining in the half. Baltimore had rallied to tie the score, only to see the Patriots navigate the length of the field in just over two minutes against New England's 3-4 defense. And his concern was borne out in the final 30 minutes as the gang-tackling Patriots shut down his Colts cold. You are supposed to be able to beat the 3-4 up the middle. But it was here that New England was toughest, as every yard Baltimore gained came more grudging than the last. England's offense, on the other hand, was content to sit on the ball, bide its time, wait for a break, and eat up the clock. This strategy on the surface did not appear sound in light of Baltimore's capacity to deny points and score them very quickly. Setback Don Calhoun proved more than an able stand-in for Sam Cunningham. Number 44 was a valued outlet receiver and in addition picked up 141 yards rushing. Quarterback Steve Grogan passed sparingly and achieved modest results. Grogan refused to succumb to the temptation of throwing the bomb and with a game plan watered down to the basics, his offense drowned and failed to score a point in the second half of the offense that Burt Jones became a mirror for Colt frustration. Arizona State. Haynes number 40 was the Patriots first draft choice and their trust in his abilities was reflected by the blanket he placed on the skills of Roger Carr. Twice Haynes intercepted home runs by Jones intended for number 81. Both times Carr appeared to have outrun the secondary. But both times the long-legged cornerback outran the ball and ran the Patriots out of deep trouble. Time after time the opportunistic Patriots choked off the most versatile and highest scoring offense in the NFL. Another surprising aspect of New England's dominance was their ability to seep through the Colts offensive line and pressure Burt Jones. New England never noted for their pass rush employed the seldom used talents of reserve linebacker Pete Barnes, number 59. Barnes, subbing for regular Steve Nelson, sacked Jones three times and by game's end the pocket had turned into a shambles a disaster area that marked the spot where the cold offense died. The Patriots and Colts played a scoreless tie in the final 30 minutes and New England won a crucial 21 to 14 victory. The heroics of Pete Barnes not only kept a wild card berth alive, but a divisional title in the AFC East as well. Receptions and beat the New York Jets 38 to 24. Every member of the secondary of Fox, McRae, Howard and Haynes intercepted at least one pass. Prentice McRae stole two and ran both of them back for touchdowns. The Jets were drowned in a flood tide of easy touchdowns as the Patriots won their third in a row. The weather was better downstate on Long Island where Steve Grogan and company worked out against the Jets. Andy Johnson's effort resulted in the first Patriot score. And in all, Steve Grogan accounted for three touchdowns through the air.
Richard Todd started again for New York and threw a scoring pass of his own to surprising Rookie of the Year candidate, Clark Gaines, number 21. As has become custom lately with the Jets, Joe Namath relieved Todd after the game's first two series, and he added still another touchdown pass. But the Jet quarterbacks could not keep the ball away from the greedy New England defenders. Of 10 total turnovers for New York, seven were interceptions, and two were returned for long touchdowns by number 34, Prentice McCray. The Patriots won their eighth game, which assured them their best season in the last 10 years. Broncos were blown away by the strong winds of the Patriot rush, which downed their quarterbacks nine times. This game mirrored Patriot depth at all positions, especially running back. Without Sam Cunningham, Don Calhoun, Andy Johnson, and rookie Ike Forte combined for nearly 350 yards rushing and an imposing 38 to 14 victory. This season, New England Steve Grogan has been a headline maker. But somewhat overlooked has been the Patriots' much improved defense led by the likes of number 78, Tony McGee, a six-year veteran defensive end. Last week in a playoff spot showdown, there was no way Bronco quarterback Steve Ramsey could overlook the Patriot defenders because they spent a good part of the afternoon in his lap or on his back. When the front line wasn't harassing Ramsey, the deep backs were. Talented rookie cornerback Mike Haynes, number 40, made this Willie Mays-like interception, which helped limit the Broncos to 14 points for the afternoon. Not content with a mere defensive role, Haynes then turned to offense taking this Bronco punt all the way from East Boston to Foxborough. The 62-yard scoring play left the Buck and Broncos broken and saddle sore. Then with Grogan at the reins and 177-yard rusher Don Calhoun and number 38 rookie Ike Forte applying the Spurs, the New England offense galloped to victory number nine, 38 to 14. Barring some unusual misfortune, it looks like the New England Patriots will be bringing a new team into the NFL playoff picture for 1976. When injuries struck down tight end Russ Francis, the Patriots' fifth victory in a row was launched by his replacement, Al Chandler, number 87. Their 27-6 triumph over the New Orleans Saints. New England clinched a playoff spot with a 27-6 victory over the Saints. The Patriots in the playoffs is not the only surprise. Many are calling them the best team in the league, and not without reason. The New England running game that trampled over 330 yards two weeks ago against Denver ran up 220 yards against New Orleans last week. The Patriots' brilliant young quarterback, Steve Grogan, scored his 10th and 11th touchdowns to tie Johnny Lujak and Tobin Roth's record for touchdowns by a quarterback in one season.
the Patriots can pass, too. Grogan threw two more scoring passes against the Saints for a season total of 18. It seems the Patriots can do no wrong. A stingy defense, good special teams, and the AFC's second highest scoring offense make it look so easy, despite the fact that New England can't sneak up and surprise anyone anymore. With Tampa Bay coming up this week, don't be surprised if the surprising Patriots turn last year's 3-11 and record into this year's 11-3. and And don't be surprised if the Patriots go even further once the playoffs begin. John McKay's winless season has eroded his ordinarily keen sense of humor and placed his team on the verge of making history. Against New England, McKay's Pirates set out to avoid making the record books. Fullback Ed Williams' 17-yard run lifted Tampa Bay into a surprising first-half lead. And before the good luck spell had worn off, the Buccaneers dazzled the playoff-bound New Englanders with yet another semblance of solid offense, a touchdown pass. But while Tampa Bay could only flirt with offensive success, New England's potent ground attack demonstrated its mastery of the subject and pro football's second most productive ground game powered through the touchdown alleys. Andy Williams followed this 69-yard sprint with a nine-yard touchdown run in the second half as New England knotted the score at 14. But on this day, Tampa Bay seemed destined to become part of NFL folklore. Sam Hunt's 68-yard interception return and encore added the epilogue to Tampa Bay's abysmal 1976 story. With this defeat, the Buccaneers became the first team in NFL history to finish 0-14. While for the tough young Patriots, it's on to the playoffs. Quarterback sensation Steve Grogan had plenty of time to wait for an open receiver, then pass to tight end Russ Francis far downfield. Francis' one-handed catch brought the Patriots all the way to the Oakland 27. It was a gain of 40 yards and a great individual effort by the multi-talented tight end, who has been injured the past several games. Soon after Francis' big play, Grogan again with absolutely no Raider rush to worry about threw to Darrell Stingley for 24 yards and the Patriots had a first down on the Raider one. On the very next play, Andy Johnson followed Sam Cunningham into the end zone for a touchdown and the first score of the playoffs. New England had looked very impressive on a 10-play, 86-yard drive against the Silver and Black. But the second half would be a different story. Sam Cunningham's 22-yard carry on New England's initial second-half possession loosened up Raider linebackers, allowing Steve Grogan to get the ball to his most effective offensive weapon. The awesome figure of Russ Francis continued to plague the Raiders' secondary. With Stingley and Vataha well covered, Grogan could find no other outlet on passing downs, but apparently he didn't need one.
France's 26-yard catch and run regained the lead for New England. The six-foot-six-inch tight end had delivered New England's two biggest plays of the afternoon, and his clutch performance was well received by his pass-catching counterparts. Another angle on the play reveals that Grogan looked the Raiders to the right, then threw back underneath to a crossing Francis, who left Raiders strewn along the trail. The oddsmakers said the Patriots didn't belong, but the Raiders were having a tough time convincing them. But playing with the poise of a 10-year veteran, Steve Grogan continued to keep the Raiders off balance. A swing pass to A.J. Johnson spread out the linebackers. Then Grogan went to his ground game, and former Raider Jess Phillips did the damage. Filling in for Johnson, Phillips picked up the nine most crucial yards on this Patriot drive, the last nine, as New England powered in for the score. Indeed, Chuck Fairbanks' squad had silenced the odds makers, for during period three, they owned the scrimmage line, set the tempo of the game, and dominated all phases of play. And a loyal contingent of Patriot wives and friends sensed a big upset in the making. Litnikoff rarely dropped the football. In a must situation, Stabler guided the Raiders 70 yards in 11 plays, and Mark Van Egan added the finishing touch. Though Dorman threw most of period three, the Raider offense executed when it had to, with a well-balanced chemistry of Ken Stabler and Fred Bolitnikoff as its driving force. Oakland lurked within striking distance, and so the burden fell upon the Patriot offense to control the football and keep it away from Mr. Stabler. Once again, Steve Grogan was called upon to take charge in a crucial situation, and once again, Grogan proved his mettle. Grogan's 10-yard keeper carried to the Oakland 37. Two plays later, the Patriot ground game came back the other way on the power of Sam Cunningham. Little did Sam Cunningham realize that his stepping out of bounds where he did would prove to be a pivotal event in this football game. The official spotted the ball just outside the 27-yard line. Either a first down by an inch or a third down with an inch or so to go. The chains rendered their verdict, and it proved to be significant. The Oakland Raiders didn't win 13 regular season games making mistakes, nor for that matter did the New England Patriots. But something about the do or die pressure of playoff football separates the great teams from the mere good ones. The Raider defense dug in, prepared for the moment of truth. The Patriot offense did the same, but that moment of truth never arrived. Steve Grogan lunged forward for a first down, but half the Patriot team preceded him into the neutral zone. The illegal procedure call put the ball back five yards. And for Chuck Fairbanks' young squad, a second, more important moment of truth had arrived. On a controversial play, Raider linebacker Phil Villapiano stripped tight end Russ Francis of the football. Francis and Grogan argued long and loud that Villapiano had interfered with him before he had an opportunity to make the catch. Television replays indeed showed contact had taken place between the two. But as is normally the case when irate football players challenge the authority of officials, the Patriots' vented frustration went for naught. New England's almost flawless performance seemed to be deteriorating as period four wore on. But the controversy over this play obscured the significance of the event that followed. Leading by four with the ball at Oakland's 32, Coach Chuck Fairbanks sent the field goal unit onto the field. For John Smith, a 50-yard field goal attempt, one that could have ensured the Patriots of at least an overtime. But it was not in the cards.
John Smith's attempt would fall just short. One wonders what the Raiders would have done had New England punted deep into Raider territory. Instead, Oakland took over at their own 32. Down, Stabler went for it all. And though his pass would fall incomplete, it would be the biggest incompletion of Oakland's season. Stabler's rainbow for Carl Garrett fell to earth harmlessly. No interference was called on the play. But back up field, the umpire had thrown his flag. And though Carl Garrett didn't know it yet, his being open contributed handily to Oakland's eventual victory. A repeat of the play shows that Patriot nose guard Ray Hamilton, number 71, arrived at Kenny Stabler just as he released the football. The call? Roughing the quarterback. A tragic bit of misfortune for the Patriots who nearly put the Raiders into a fourth down and 18 situation. The Raiders had been granted a second win, and the Patriots would live to regret it. Moments ago, Ken Stabler's chances of getting to Super Bowl XI seemed remote. Now Stabler moved the Raiders in for the kill. Dave Casper's big catch carried to the Patriot eight-yard line. It seemed almost a foregone conclusion that Oakland would score the winning touchdown. But the proud young Patriot defense breathed one last gasp and threatened to make a successful goal line stand. But good fortune had smiled on the Patriots long enough. And Chuck Fairbanks sensed his defensive team would need a miracle of a higher magnitude to stop the unfolding of the inevitable. On second down from the New England one, Kenny Stabler dealt New England the crushing blow. Ken Stabler and the Oakland Raiders specialize in come from behind last second wins. The snake once again had slithered into the victory column with a superb clutch performance, one of the gutsiest in modern football history. And an emotionally spent sideline could only watch in agonizing silence as Oakland celebrated its last-minute triumph. New England's sole consolation is the knowledge that they can play even up with one of pro football's finest teams. But in the end, their playoff inexperience caught up with them. On December 18th, Oakland resembled one of those tough nightclubs that try out up-and-coming talent. The auditions are rough, the audience even rougher. The Patriots' 48-17 regular season victory was the only blemish on the Raiders' record. So the silver and black were a mad and angry team, bent on harassing, intimidating, and punching out the Patriots. After 15 furious minutes, the Patriots needed dentists and doctors more than draws and screens when Oakland left them bruised, but not broken. The Patriots dug down deep into their spiritual reserves and doled out clean, hard hits, measure for measure. Where there was once hope, there was now a wellspring of confidence. They knew they could do it. So they went out and did it. For three quarters, the Patriots outthought and outfought the future Super Bowl champions and led 21 to 10. There were no mysteries or trick plays, just the culmination of a season of hard work. 
Early in the fourth quarter, Oakland scored. And with 57 seconds remaining and the Patriots leading 21-17, the Raiders reached their 27. On third and 18, number 71, Raymond Hamilton was called for roughing Ken Stabler. Instead of an incompleted pass and a fourth and impossible situation, Chuck Fairbank's team was against the wall with the Raiders at the one. A storm of controversy clouded the scrimmage line. After winning all the battles, the New England Patriots were about to lose the war. Oakland scored with 10 seconds left on the clock. And for the New England Patriots, their dreams were finally and cruelly crushed. They had traveled so far, only to fall inches short. There is no reason to dwell on defeat after a season of accomplishment. They played their last game unlike they played their first. They had come in like a lamb and gone out a lion. Their dramatic turnaround from 3 and 11 to 11 and 3 was unprecedented in league history. They will be back because they're young, well coached, and deep. They're the New England Patriots and their winners. <laughs>